Welcome on my podcast Permission Entrepreneurial that can be translated by Entrepreneurship Permission. Here we talk about new ways of living, being bold, think and act out of the box. I want this podcast to be empowering and inspiring. I wish you a good listening. Welcome on this new episode on I Choose My Life Now. I welcome Regan today. Hello, Regan. Hello, how are you? Great, thank you. I'm so happy to welcome you here. So we met at freediving together in Costa Rica. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so I think your story is pretty inspiring because so we met our new neighbors, uh, Danish ones. Um, so with Maria, which was here on a, an episode, the first one of this series in English. And in fact, you are the teacher of the boys. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Small world. Yeah. <laughs> so... Can you please introduce yourself first and maybe why you're now here in Costa Rica and where are you coming from? And from that, we will continue. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, so my name is Reagan. Um, some call me Teacher Reagan. I am originally from the U.S., from Texas, and started my teaching career out there in Houston, Texas. I was in inner city schools. And I will save you a very long story um, that is very similar probably to a lot of teachers this these days. Um, the workload and the stress mm -hmm. and the administrative burden of it just became too much. And so um, I took what I called a sabbatical in my late 20s. I don't know if that actually works, um, <laughs> but that's what I called it. Um, I took a break and... Um, I moved home for a while and I just was done with teaching. So I thought, um, but I had studied abroad in Costa Rica and university. And during that sabbatical, uh, I revisited Costa Rica and just kind of started thinking, well, what if I tried to do some international education and tried to, um, find a, a job here in Costa Rica. And so at that time I put out my resume, I made some emails and I got a job at an alternative school in San Jose, Costa Rica, the capital. And I really, really liked it. I learned a lot, but once again, it was a part of a system that just had a heavy burden of bureaucracy and administrative weight that um, was, was too heavy for me as a teacher. And ultimately that stress uh, was projected onto my students and I just didn't find it to be a, a great educational environment. And so I chose to create my own educational environment. And so here I am now. Um, we're about four hours outside of the city now in the jungle. And uh, I lead a small lo learning cooperative with Maria's kids as well. We have 10 students from all over the world. And um, we do what I call experiment experiential learning. So we do a lot of community work and get into the jungle, the beaches, um, and do a lot of conservation type of work um, to get our hands dirty learning. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is amazing because, yeah, I remember like when I was at school, you stay in the same room for hours and hours and always like in front of a, a table board or a screen or mm -hmm. whatever. And You are offering always uh, also a new way of um, teaching yeah. and living a school as a as a child, and, and I think it's amazing. Maria told me that you're doing an incredible work with a ch with a children. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, like because you have, it's just a group of 10, You also have so much time to know each child and to follow like. The program they have and apparently yeah you were super careful about that right and i remember in france well my class was around 25 to 30 mm -hmm. children so that's a lot and of course one teacher cannot uh, be careful and and yeah take care of each right. child so thank you for your work yeah yeah um it's a little bit difficult to sum everything up and uh, i try my best but i'm gonna backtrack a little bit so when i was in houston um, my first few years of teaching um, i taught 150 students every single day mm -hmm. and i was also an assistant principal in an assistant principal type role and an admin type of role on top of that so It was just so much. And you were mentioning like the connection that you make with the kids. It just, 
I think that's my like true passion for teaching and also maybe my my uh, my talent for teaching um and that was just impossible and it, of course that led to burnout because who can connect on that level with 150 people not not to mention the families and your coworkers and all of that um and so now yeah we have a really really um I think that's a big part of our model we have a really close relationship with not just each individual student but with the family as well um, one thing I also wanted to mention is uh, of those 10 students, we're multi-age. So we have all the way from six years up to 12 years. And there's no set grade level like you would see in a traditional school. We do use some traditional curriculum guidance so that kids can stay on track for where they might be in the future if they go back to their home country or travel again to a different country, um, just so there's some alignment with other learning communities. Um, but yeah, it's very, very personalized. Um, it requires a lot of conversation with the students, with the parents, and uh, what's best for the kid. Um, we talk a lot about uh, the triangle of support, which is the student, the parent, and the teacher. And there's really no outside bureaucracy or admin, um, principal, anybody. The people who are making the decisions for the child are the people who are directly related to the child and working with the child, or most importantly, the child themselves. So it's a huge part of our our model. And I feel super, super l- lucky and honored and privileged to to be in this role that I'm in. Yeah, of course. And yes, I totally forgot to mention it, but you are working with international families and children. Correct. And this is obvious for me now because I'm living in Costa Rica, but it's true that here it's a, a lot of people, um, expats. That's correct. And you are uh, teaching through them. So it's true that there is like movement, I guess, some children starting maybe in June and stopping a few months later or yes. whatever. So I think that's something to... to Yeah, that's been a learning process. <laughs> <laughs> um, consistency is not something that um, is the same as it was in my previous life as a teacher. Uh, but I think it's a, a unique opportunity for us to constantly evolve, which at this point in human evolution with technology and everything, our access to information being so... Um, easy to you can find information anywhere we have to evolve quickly and so um sometimes it it's it feels like it's moving really really fast but at the same time uh we are able to really um move and be flexible to be guided by what the students really are interested in passionate about um naturally talented at, um, all of those factors can really play a role versus having to follow a stagnant curriculum. Um, and I'm kind of getting off task, so I'll bring it back to the um, expat community totally. Um, there are people here from all over the world, and some of those people are here to stay, and they found home here. And other people are here for three months. So we have, we work on a 10 week on, three week off cycle. So we work on terms to really allow people to, to move if they need to, um, Mm -hmm. to get out and move and reset every three months. So it's about a three month cycle. So you're following the cycle of the visa runs. Exactly. (laughs) I love that. 90 day, 90 day visa. And I do want to just say, um, our ultimate goal is to establish ourselves as a part of the community here. Um, it, nobody mentions how hard it is to start an international entrepreneurship project uh, that is a progressive education thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm learning along the way, but our eventual goal is to have that um, community be open and accessible to everybody here, including the local community. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work now with teaching English and I have some um, Costa Rican Tico uh, clients as well for tutorials. Um, but I'd really, we would really like to get to a point where we merge those things and have a very diverse community that is not just expats and not just Ticos, but a, a true representation of what the culture here looks like these days. Yeah, that would be just amazing. Yeah. And so um, the story of the boys, the Danish ones, mm-hmm. I think is very, 
well, relevant for me because when I was a child, so I'm born and raised in France and in Brittany. So in Brittany, you have um, a language which is called Breton, the Britain. And it's very specific, like it's absolutely not French, it's not English, it's, it's like a very specific language. And some schools now, alternative schools, are trying to keep it alive. Mm -hmm. And so when I was three, I started school. And so I just arrived in school where the teachers were only speaking uh, Britain. Mm -hmm. And I, was on, I only knew French. And it's crazy because when you're three or even like five, six, you don't care in a way and you just learn even super quickly the language. Yeah. And it does totally se make sense and it's totally okay. And the, so the boys are Danish. So they not really speak, uh, English. Well, they, in the past, they were not speaking English, but now, a few weeks later, they, they do. Yeah. <laughs> Even the smallest Yeah. Point. You know, kids are sponges. They yeah. just soak it all in. And um, one of the biggest reasons why I love being a teacher and working with kids is um, kids are really raw and authentic and open to to new things, to learning, to trying things, putting themselves out there, naturally being vulnerable, things that adults after years of yeah. interaction with other humans and life and other things, we, we tend to close up and uh, we aren't as open anymore, but kids, they're not, they're open. And yeah, both of the boys are just growing every day, um, starting to even speak in sentences and things like that. Um, we're taking it at their own pace. There's not a lot of pressure for them to, um, there's a different level of output and expectation that we have for the boys um, compared to our native English speakers in the class. Um, we also have Spanish study as well. So then it gets even a little bit more complicated because that's a third language that they're now learning. Um, but we just, you know, ask the same of them as all the other kids that they try their best and, and that they have fun and, um, that they work with each other. Um, and, and they do, and it's so cute. It's so awesome. Um, it gives me chills to like see and, and see their growth. Um, yeah. And every day I'm learning as well from the kids, how to put myself out there and grow a little bit more too. Yeah. yeah. I think like children also great teachers. I'm not oh, yes. mom now, but I think that the day I will be one, you're you're also like learning so much from your child. It's crazy. totally, totally. I think that's a big part of it too. Is um, in a traditional model, or in 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 maybe not just a traditional model. I don't want to like put boxes on things, and I'm certainly not here to say that my version of education is the best version of education. I think um, it's just another option that exists. Um, but in a lot of models, we do try to squeeze everything. Like kids have to know everything we have to teach them. And there's so much like stress and pressure and anxiety that goes into um, the amount of learning. But the truth of it is, is that it doesn't matter how old you are. You're always going to be learning. And so um, keeping that, again, openness to making mistakes and being vulnerable and putting yourself out there, you're always going to learn. There's always going to be something that you don't know that that. Um, is an opportunity to grow and develop from. So yes, when you become a mom, you're going to, I'm sure, <laughs> I learn guess. a lot. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. You were um, talking about the challenges also you you are meeting right now. Um, this podcast, um, when I created it last year, was very about all about entrepreneurship. Yes. And I would like, if you're open to that, if you can talk also about your challenges you're meeting right now, that would be, I think, very yes, interesting. Um, where should I start? <laughs> <laughs> so first and foremost, I'm a teacher and I direct the group. Um, I think I need to set some more, um, set the scene a little bit more about what it looks like on a day to day. Um, I currently do have an assistant, a partner, um, but in terms of the workload, I am doing all of, I direct the entire program and I teach full time. Um, and so that I'm running at 110% always, uh, focused on the kids and that, but I am an international 
tourist legally here, which means that my business has to follow certain legal requirements in order to um, have a distribution of money coming and going and all of that. And so I will admit that I'm still a little bit in the middle of that process, again, trying to establish myself more here versus as an American being hired as an American education consultant, which is what I'm currently folk or functioning as, to being an established learning community here. And with that, there is a learning process of the legal structure here in Costa Rica and what's that what that looks like. Um, I'm not interested in being a, an educational establishment that has a governing body outside of our families. So we function as a cooperative, which means my admin, my my oversight is the parents, the people who are directly related to the kids in the classroom. Mm-hmm. And I have I have no interest in in putting layers of bureaucracy and hierarchy above that. Um, I think that that dilutes the the power of the education and the learning in the classroom. And so I don't want to do that. And so figuring out how then we establish ourselves as a learning community here. Um, the other part is that we're not here to make a lot of money. Um, everything on top of my salary, which I'm completely transparent with all accounting with the parents, um, everything above my salary gets funneled back into the school. And in that way, technically we're a nonprofit. We're not for profit, but the process for legally registering as a nonprofit here in Costa Rica is very (laughs) difficult and long process and very, very expensive even to, um, Register as a business here in Costa Rica is quite expensive. Um, the startup costs are a couple of thousand dollars, which is more than my salary even is. Um, so we're still trying to figure that out. Actually, I have a meeting with a lawyer tomorrow morning. Ooh. <laughs> so please wish me luck on that. We'll see how that goes. It's the other thing, uh, is that, um, I've, I think this is my fourth lawyer. Uh, the first one, we had a couple of meetings. We were ready to do the paperwork and then just disappeared, which uh, the conversations I've had with some people, that's common. That happens here. Um, and then the other two, we had a meeting set and then they just were too busy and they couldn't make the meeting. And so I'm really hoping that this one works out. Okay. Um, it's, it's, Pura vida. Exactly. Pura vida. It's not like in the States I'm used to If I wanted to incorporate a business, for example, I could go online and do it in five minutes and pay a hundred bucks and be done with it. And yeah, and that's just not the case here. Um, But like I said, this is where I want to be. This is, I want to establish myself as a part of this community. So I don't have a lot more to say than that. It's been a process. Um, I'll let you know how it goes after our meeting tomorrow morning with the lawyer. Oh yeah, I can't wait. (laughs) Podcast part two. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, um, and I guess to, like, when you have a project, but then you, as you said, there is so much paperwork, and here in Costa Rica, it's special because, uh, yeah, online things doesn't work here. It's always through an attorney or lawyer. Exactly. And the paperwork, it's just paper. There is nothing online. Yeah. So... Uh, I know it's crazy and I think sometimes it's frustrating also for you to, you have a vision for a project and you are sometimes a bit blocked. Yeah. How you manage that? Avoidance. <laughs> uh, I, I just prioritize the kids and before I know it, it's officially this project came into my hands um, because I started here in Uvita with a small group. Um, actually last April, April of 2022. Okay. And there was a parent leading the group and just paying me as an employee. So the liability, the tax, all of that was under her responsibility. And I just was like the employee. Um, 
And in January is when I, I took it over as my own. And we're now almost to June. And it just it gets deprioritized because I'm here. For, I'm showing up every day for the kids and um, lesson planning. And we've got a big event next week and mm-hmm. all of these things that we're doing. And um, and then the next thing I know, it's six months later and I haven't done the the legal thing yet. And so um, I do think that there's a lot of privilege in the way that my clients have worked out because they're all expats. There's like a gray area. We're all tourists. And so I'm, they're paying me as a tourist. And so for the most part, it's, it's hands off. Nobody, nobody's really worried about that. You know, we're here, we're spending our money as tourists and we're, we're flowing in the, uh, in the economy here. And so it's fine. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I just avoid the stuff <laughs> that I don't want to do, yeah. like reschedule a lawyer for the fourth time. Yeah. <laughs> I hired an assistant. That's also what I do. Mm. Um, so I ask for advice a lot from my parents and I, again, I don't have oversight besides them. So we'll have, cooperative meetings and I'll let them know this is this is what's on my plate right now and uh, one of the parents suggested that I get a virtual assistant and so I hired a part-time virtual assistant and I just keep a running to-do list of all the things that I don't want to deal with and she works it out so shout out to Amanda if you're listening (laughs) thank you that's Um, great because that's a step too oh it was great oh it immediately weight lifted off my shoulders wonderful yeah yeah But what I really like also is that you're showing to a world that it's possible to have this kind of project. Um, yeah. Because it's not nothing to build a little school to welcome uh, children and in a country where the paperwork is hard and they also have a totally different way of teaching here. Like this, this the govern, like I would say, the state um, school cool yeah the what did we say uh, local students have to be in a school that is governed by this the state the yeah, the country you. the ministry of education here yes. but then the the, the the way of the way of teaching is totally different that oh what totally offer yes and so i think that's also really inspiring because you're a tourist and you just arrived in a country that you like and you build something and like parents also into that project and that maybe some people listening to this podcast will be also inspired by maybe or finding schools like this around themselves or even maybe creating one and it's possible. Yeah, I totally think that this is a model that could be repeated um, for independent teachers, for homeschool families that want to have a little bit more of like a social group to work in a collaborative community totally possible and any project whether it's a a small education cooperative like this or any dream that you have of of pursuing I think it's all about action and once you take that first step of action towards making it possible there's momentum that goes behind that and it I think also this idea of like the perfect vision of whatever your goal is, um, we have to be willing to, to let that go a little bit because once you, once you reach one goal, you have a new goal and then the line moves and you're never actually meeting your goals. You're just, it's forward momentum and it's just constant forward momentum. And I'm kind of like ranting right here, but I think anybody who's willing to listen to a podcast that's, um, on this topic will probably understand, um, just making that forward momentum, I remember when I was first even considering um, making this move, I was in San Jose in that school and I was just feeling that burnout again that I had felt in the States and almost having like an existential moment. Like, what am I going to do? I'm a teacher. I'm really good at teaching. I want to teach. I want to be with students. I can't exist in this model. What do I do? And took a trip to the beach and along the coast here on the way to the beach, you see all these signs for little like eco communities and stuff. Yeah. And I just thought to myself, surely they need a teacher. And so 
that thought, just even putting that thought in my head opened up this realm of the universe where I started to notice those opportunities, which eventually led me to connect with that mom who had the group here. And I just took it. I just took that step forward. And oh, here I am, what, a month and three months or a year and three months later, still forward momentum. I haven't figured it all out. I don't know that I ever will, but we're learning and growing, which is the point of education, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. And I had also a big momentum last summer. Yeah. It was, as you said, we have one goal. Once it's reached, we have another goal. And even if it's the first one is not reached, we always, we, at the same time, we, we know the other goal. And so we always uh, looking after a new goal. And at some point, it can bring to also to burn out. Or, totally. Um, and so now I'm more about enjoying the path, you know, just looking around, taking some time. And I know I have goals and I'm still reaching them and making them real. But it's all about also enjoying the path. Totally. Because otherwise, if you don't um, just look around and look at your path, then you will never see your life um, moving forward. Oh, yeah, progressing. Progress, yeah. Totally. You sound like a teacher right now. You sound, <laughs> you sound like what I tell my students all the time, and it's totally true. Yeah. Um, we do a practice of gratitude to really ground ourselves in the present moment and take a look at where we're at. And with gratitude and respect for where we've come from and how far we've grown already. And also, um, you know, breathing into the the strength to keep moving towards our goals and, and to, to keep moving. And yeah. Yeah, exactly. And could you explain us what is like the basic week at your school? Oh, basic week. Yeah, uh, I can. So we follow, as I said, a 10 week schedule. Um, and Monday through Thursday is in the classroom, um, air quotes classroom, because uh, the school is actually in my house. And so my kitchen, my living room, my family room, all of that is a part of the school. And so um, the kids are there. We start with some morning mindfulness where we talk about gratitude and the things that we just said, setting our goals for the day and our intentions. Um, we have some academic type of classes based on more, a more traditional model in the morning. Uh, we do like math, writing, and reading are specifically our focus. And then in the afternoon, we do projects. Our projects are based more in humanities and science. And so that's Monday through Thursday. We follow that schedule. On Fridays, they are called Fun Fridays. And so either we are out in the community, maybe we're at a beach waterfall, maybe we're doing some service like a beach cleanup, or uh, we've even worked with local disaster relief um, programs to donate goods or sort goods, things like that. Um, or sometimes we just hang out on campus and enjoy the school space uh, with each other. We play video games or we do art. Um, it's kind of more based on the moment on Fridays. And yeah, and all of that is an, what the nine weeks look like. And then week 10 is what we call an adventure week. So the kids plan the Monday through Thursday of our very last week together to be um, service-based adventure. So for example, this adventure week, which is coming up at the end of June, um, we'll be doing some art with some driftwood found on the beach um, and doing some storytelling with that art. We will be visiting the river where there's some natural water slides and uh, we'll do a little picnic and hang out there for the day. And then we will do an overnight reforestation project at a local organization called Community Carbon Trees. They have a native tree nursery and they work with local farmers and local land reserves to replant some of the forests that have been cut down due to development. So we'll actually go and visit the nursery and then we'll have a little overnight bonding, uh, cooking dinner together. And then in the morning we'll wake up and plant some of those trees. So okay. yeah. I want to go back to school. Yeah, totally. Come visit. <laughs> totally. It's really fun. 
I, I would be lying if I said that a lot of the learning that we do isn't for, for me. Um, I get a lot out of it too. I love the kids and totally they're learning and they love it and they have a lot of say in what we do, but totally. I love my life. I love my job. It's so fun to, to do these adventures with the kids. That's yeah. amazing to hear. Like, yeah. You love your job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great. <laughs> I love waking up every day. And yeah, it's so great, which is not what it was like when I was mm -hmm. when I was in a more uh, traditional setting. And I think that's my last question. But you say you talked about intention. And do you have an intention for each child you take care of? Yes, totally. Uh, my intention for each child uh, is for them to develop their own interests, their own passions, to know themselves, to question themselves so that they can become self-actualized in the world, which means that they'll be able to achieve their their true potential. And what that is, is, is unique to every single one of them. They're, each individual is going to have their own potential and their own self-actualized version of themselves. And so for my kids, my intention and my goal is for, for them to know how to navigate the world around them as their authentic selves by asking questions, by being curious, by collaborating with others, um, all of those things. They learn to do those things now as children in a small community so that when they get out into the big community, they, they, They know what to do and they they know how to do it with confidence and with pride in themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And this is so empowering. Thank you yeah. so much for that. Yeah. I hope I you know, I, I hope it works. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Well, thank you so much, Regan, for this moment together. And I will um put your Instagram account also in the description of this podcast. So for the one who wants to follow your yeah. journey, they just have to follow you and your Instagram account. Yeah. Um, I'd love to connect with other um, groups that are doing something similar. So please reach out if you're listening and you want to connect. Let me know. Yeah. <laughs> well, the message is passed now. Yes, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy your journey. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you liked it and feel inspired, I invite you to share it with your family and friends. To support this podcast, you can give it five stars, comment, and add it in your favorites. There are more episodes in English to come on the third Friday of each month. And follow me on Instagram. <laughs> Bye!